Yeah, I'd like to talk to you about building, debugging, and tuning ML workflows, or in Spark, what we call them as ML pipelines. Um, my background is machine learning, uh, Apache Spark committer, and work as a software engineer at Databricks. So just 30 second overview of MLlib. Uh, it's one of the four big libraries built on top of Spark, uh, starting at Berkeley as a research project with entering Spark at 0 0.8 and several releases later, contributions from a lot of organizations, many individuals, and a pretty good coverage of distributed algorithms. Uh, here's, I think, a mostly complete list of the coverage, but basically you can see big categories, classification, regression, recommendation, clustering, a lot of feature extraction, so on. Um, but what we want to do, of course, is not just have a, you know, huge bag of algorithms, but allow users to quickly tie these together, use their custom algorithms, and so on. And here's the motivation. So ML workflows are not just applying, of course, a single one of those algorithms. Uh, they're complex. Here's a simple one. You load data, extract features, train a model, evaluate it. But of course, it can quickly become a lot more complicated. You may have multiple data sources, and then extracting features might actually involve a bunch of steps, which may depend on the particular data source. Training a model might not be a single model. You might train several models and then maybe average their outputs together in some smart ensemble method. Uh, and only then do you get to evaluate or productionize or whatever your system. So they're complex. And what we'd like to be able to do is, first of all, just specify this complex workflow in the first place. Then once we run it and get a wrong answer, we want to be able to inspect and debug it. Finally, after we've gotten it right the way we want it to be, we want to be able to rerun on new data and also tune parameters where each of those components might have various parameters. Tuning might adjust the uh, accuracy, the speed, et cetera. So I'll talk about how we address this with this pipelines API. And I'll use a running example of text classification, where given a text document uh, from actually this 20 news groups data set, a uh, pretty famous ML data set, if you're familiar with it. Uh, but basically, we'll have text features and use them to predict a zero or one label, whether this article is about science or not about science. And just as an aside, the data representation uh, will be data frames. Hopefully you heard Michael's data frames talk earlier today, but if not, this is what they are. A nice tabular representation, data grouped into named columns with different types. Here you can see we have three columns, department, age, and name, and every row is an instance or a training example maybe in our data set. The other nice thing about data frames is a very simple API. Here, it's grouping every row in this data set by department, and then taking the average of the ages in each group. Uh, and there are a lot of other kinds of operations you can use in this domain-specific language, uh, including working with metadata and user-defined functions. Uh, so because of this like, nice, easily interpretable, uh, but, but powerful representation, we'll use it as the de facto ML data set. So here's our workflow, and we're going to keep it very simple for the sake of this talk and my demo. Um, but we'll start by loading data, just using the data frames, data sources, uh, some of which are built in and some of which use the external data source API. After you load the data, you'll have a data frame. And so I'm going to explain this by writing out the current data schema in this workflow. So at the beginning of our workflow, uh, we've loaded, say, a label column of type int, you know, zero or one, science or not science. Um, text, which is just a string, the full string of the article. Um, and as we go through this workflow, uh, the way we're going to think about it is a data frame will flow through and be modified uh, by changing the schema. So in the feature extraction part, what we're going to need to do is basically get features which an ML algorithm can understand. And the way we'll do it is actually in two steps here. It's getting more complicated. A tokenizer and a hashed, what I'll call hash term frequency module. So the tokenizer takes the entire text of the article 
and breaks it into a bunch of words, just a sequence of strings. So it's appending a new column called words to this data frame. That data frame is passed to the next module, hash term frequency, and it outputs a new column called features, which is just a fixed length vector, which is you know, numerical and easily understood by machine learning algorithms. So of course, finally we get, uh, oh, I should mention, these are in blue because they fit the transformer abstraction. Uh, and that's an abstraction which takes a data frame and converts it to another data frame. Very general uh, and very flexible. So after we've done this feature transformation, uh, we have our current data schema here. And now the data will flow to the training module, which, for which we'll use logistic regression. Now it can select the columns it needs, in this case, label and features, train on those to learn how to predict that label, and produce a logistic regression model, uh, which can then make predictions on every row in our data set and add a new column of predictions. This is in red, uh, fitting the estimator abstraction, which takes a data frame, trains on it, and produces a model. And so finally, we get to evaluation. Uh, and this is going to select from the label column, which is the true label from our data set, uh, as well as the prediction, our, predictin, our, our predicted label. It can compare them and tell us how well we did. Uh, this is an evaluator abstraction, uh, basically taking a data frame and returning some metric, you know, indicating whether you're doing well or doing badly. So I'll mention two things here. One is that any of these modules can basically select from any of the previously generated columns, and then it can output one or more columns as necessary. And so by default, what we're doing is always appending new columns as data flows through our workflow. Uh, this is really nice in that you can always like, go back and inspect intermediate results. Uh, that's helpful with like, debugging, improving performance, uh, and so on. Uh, and of course, you don't actually have to keep all of this data like physically around or in memory. Uh, it's basically made efficient by data frames, which was another reason we chose to work with them, uh, where if you do need to inspect a column at some point, it can be materialized as, as needed. Cool, so these are sort of the three main uh, abstractions in our data flow. But I haven't actually mentioned what a, quote, pipeline is. And that's just going to be a wrapper for this critical part of our workflow. Now, having this wrapped in a single object has a couple uses. The first is that it can be rerun on new data in exactly the same way uh, with a single call. And of course, this basically saves the programmer a good bit of programming, um, but also lets you avoid mistakes where you might accidentally not do feature extraction in exactly the same way and this helps prevent those types of errors. The next nice thing about this is parameter tuning. Each of these components, as I mentioned, may have various parameters. Uh, for example, logistic regression takes a regularization parameter, and adjusting that can significantly affect how you do on new data, which you haven't seen during training. Uh, so in tuning, we may want to sweep over a few values of regularization, uh, see which do best on held out training data, and choose a data dependent, you know, ideal regularization parameter. Likewise, for hash term frequency, that outputs this fixed length feature vector, but we don't know how long the feature vector should be. You know, do you need 100 numbers to represent a text document, or do you need 10 billion? Um, you may not know, and it may depend on your data set. So, what we'd like to do is be able to optimize these in a data-dependent way. This is something you can do uh, basically by rote programming by hand, but again, it's easy to make mistakes, and so what we provide in this API is a cross-validator, which takes an estimator, in this case the pipeline, a parameter grid to sweep over, and an evaluator letting you compare models that you learn. Uh, and it basically automatically finds the best parameters. Cool, so these are sort of the main components that I wanted to describe. And I'd like to spend a big chunk of this actually demoing these. For that, cool. I'll be using Databricks Cloud. Um, and, 
Oh, okay. Let me quickly adjust to a... Great, okay. So this is using Databricks Cloud, but I'm going to um, basically be using Spark calls, which you can do from you know, any Spark uh, shell on your own laptop or on your own cluster. Uh, the only difference is in some of the visualizations. Um, I won't be showing off the, you know, the cool features which like Ali showed off earlier today. Um, so what we're gonna do is import some stuff here um, and then load this 20 news groups data set. Here I'm loading it as a Parquet file. Um, and cool. And I can display it. And you can see for each of these articles, um, there are about 11,000 of them. And we have uh, articles on, uh, with an ID, a topic, and the text. So given these, you can do operations using data frames, such as grouping by topic and counting. And so just lets you get a quick idea of what data are there. You know, 591 articles on electronics, you know, not quite as many on miscellaneous politics, and so on. But they're pretty evenly distributed. But what we're going to use for this demo um, is science versus not science. So here what I'm doing is filtering the documents uh, by looking at the topic column and seeing if it looks like science. And I'm really just doing this partly to show off the data frame API and show how it can be used for some initial you know, data understanding, ETL, that kind of thing, uh, before feeding it into an ML pipeline. So what I'm gonna do is create labels, science versus not science. So here I'm defining a pre-process method which will just take a data frame, create a new column called label by looking at the science, at the topic and seeing whether it's a science uh, subtopic. Uh, I'll use this to um, prepare the training data. And here there are, what, 2,300 articles about science and the rest are not. Uh, I'll likewise do this for a test data set, which I'll load but not look at yet. Cool, so after this initial ETL using the data frames uh, API, we can do what I'm really interested in doing, which is setting up this pipeline. It'll do the tokenizer, hashing TF, and logistic regression, as we mentioned before. And the way to specify this is very intuitive. Um, so here, I have a tokenizer, which takes an input column, output column, uh, hashing TF, which will create feature vectors, logistic regression, and then finally to set up the pipeline, I just give it these three stages in sequence. Cool, so to train the model, we just call pipeline.fit, and it ran this entire pipeline from feature extraction uh, to uh, outputting the final trained model. So we can evaluate prediction results, say by taking our model, transforming the training data into a new data frame, which is called predictions here. Uh, and then I'm selecting the topic, label, prediction, and text. And you can see some of them match up, so maybe we're doing okay. But as a machine learning person, really what I'd like to do is something more meaningful, such as on the entire data set, compute the area under the ROC curve. Um, if you're not familiar with that, basically close to one is perfect, uh, far from uh, close to zero is bad. So on the training data set, you know, we're doing great. But on this test data set, we're doing quite terribly. It's uh, going down from 0.99 to 0.70. And so of course, you know, the question is like, what's going on? And so you'd like to debug your pipeline. And so this is just gonna be a very simple example. Um, but I think it kind of illustrates the power of examining intermediate results to see what went wrong. So remember that as data flows through our pipeline, we keep every column around, appending by default. And so that lets us go back and say, 
you know, we can look at, say, the initial data we loaded in with ID, topic, and text. Um, we already looked at the label column we generated, and it looked good. Uh, so let's say look at the words column. Well, we're going to do that by selecting the label and the words column and examining them. And so this is essentially materializing this uh, column that we need, uh, which we may not otherwise have kept around. And you can see it's a good thing that we can do this, because this is supposed to be a whole sequence of individual words. And clearly, it's not chunking by words, as we would have expected. So we can go up and see where we generated uh, this word column. It was the output column to the regex tokenizer. And so if you look at the pattern, you know, this is chunking, this is meant to chunk by white space, but of course here it's just basically splitting words by the letter S. And that's not quite what I meant to do. So I'll just rerun this and see how we do. Um, of course, this is a contrived example, but you get the idea. If you have a complex pipeline, you can go back and inspect intermediate results and see if you know, you're doing something wrong at some point. And you can see on our test data, we used to be at 0 0.70 area under the curve, and now we've jumped up to 0.88, a lot better. Cool, so that's an example of debugging. Uh, what I'd next like to show is trying to get a bit farther and sort of bridge this gap between how we're doing on the training data of 0.99 area under the curve and on the test data of 0.88. And for that, we'll do a bit of cross-validation. Cool. So the way we're going to do this is as follows. We have a, a bunch of hyperparameters in this model. Um, and we're going to tune them using k-fold cross-validation, you know, standard ML technique by searching over a grid of number of features by regularization. And we'll optimize based on this metric, area under the ROC curve. Now, we could code this by hand, but it would be pretty cumbersome. And so what we'll instead do is first specify the parameter grid we want to search over. In this toy example, it'll just be 1,000 features uh, or 10,000 features and then different values of a regularization parameter. And then we can create a cross-validator instance, which takes as its estimator the pipeline, as its evaluator, that binary classification evaluator we constructed before, uh, which computes area under the curve, uh, the parameter grid we just specified, and finally, the number of folds. Uh, if you're not familiar with cross-validation, that just means here there are two folds, so we're splitting the data randomly in half, training on one half, testing on the other, swapping, and at the end, averaging these results, basically to find, ideally, the best point in our parameter grid, which we should use for our model. So this is doing all of this in the background. Um, and at the end, we'll have a cross-validator model, which has basically the best parameters, which we found. And we can evaluate this. So here I'm just transforming our test data calling evaluate, remember before we got area under the curve of 0.88. And now, with this cross-validator model, we jump up to 0.926. Now, of course, I only tested a few you know, parameters and only did two folds of cross-validation. In practice, you would likely want to do more. Um, and perhaps we could bring this very close to how we are doing on the training data. But this gives you a taste of what's available. Uh, and at the end, the final benefit, I'd say, of using the data frame as sort of the de facto ML data set is that we can use um, the data sources, including for outputting our results. Here I'm selecting, I'm transforming the data to make predictions and serializing these predictions to JSON. Cool, so that gives you an idea of what's available um, in ML pipelines and the main concepts and how you can use them. So just to recap, what we've provided are integration with data frames, an API which will be very familiar if you've come from scikit-learn, which also has pipelines concept, uh, easy workflow inspection, um, where you can go back and perhaps debug your pipeline, 
and also simple parameter tuning. There are a bunch of things I'd like to mention, but don't really have time to go, go into here. Uh, the first is user-defined pipeline components. You can write your own estimators, transformers, evaluators, and so on, and plug them in. There's schema validation, which basically, rather than passing your whole data set through the pipeline and then failing at the end because you made an error, um, you can pass the metadata through and hopefully catch errors before actually spending you know, a day or two running your full pipeline. If you have more complex workflows, here I just demonstrated a very simple linear chain, but you can actually compose things, a pipeline within a pipeline, or do directed acyclic graphs to have very general structures to your workflow. And finally, there's support for complex types, uh, partly via data frames, which has a lot of built-in types, uh, and partly via user-defined types, uh, which is an API we use for vectors uh, and which will be opened up to be more usable uh, in upcoming releases. So I'll just mention a little bit about the current release, which just came out, and looking ahead. In the current release, some exciting things are that pipelines are finally graduating from alpha and that there are many feature transformers which we've added. There's a more complete Python API. Uh, I did this demo um, uh, in Python, and in previous releases, I had to do it in Scala, but now it's, uh, we made an effort to make things much more complete in Python. Spark R, of course, is super exciting. Um, there is not the pipelines API there yet, but we hope to add that in the future. PMML model export and some more algorithms. Looking ahead, I'll just name a few things, including what I just mentioned, this API for Spark R for ML. Uh, improved model inspection to be able to look at both the model parameters and results, uh, and also some optimizations within pipelines, especially for doing cross-validation. Cool, so I uh, did this um, demo, of course, using Databricks, which uh, unfortunately didn't have time to show off a lot of the cool features, but hopefully you saw Ali's demo this morning. Uh, it provides notebooks, jobs, dashboards, apps, cluster manager, um, and basically, it's run by the company, founded by the creators of Spark, largest contributor. But with that, um, I'd like to leave you with a few links, which hopefully you'll find useful for references. Uh, the Spark documentation includes a nice guide explaining the pipeline concepts in more detail. Uh, there are some blog posts on pipelines and data frames. Um, if you want, are interested in trying out Databricks, definitely check out our product. There's a MOOC which will be offered looking at ML on Spark, as well as one ongoing right now on, on an intro to Spark. And finally, Spark Packages uh, hosts a number of community-driven packages, including a number of pretty cool ML ones. Cool. So with that, I hopefully you'll check out these links. And thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> So uh, I think there's time for a few questions. I got a question about the uh, TF IDF. So is it TF IDF? Um, um, it, it is. We, we separate the TF and the IDF, but yes, both are provided. And so how do you calculate the uh, DF for, or the IDF for the test corpus? Oh, I see. Um, the corpus? question was, yeah, how do you calculate those scalings and those feature transformations for the test corpus? Yeah. Basically, as, since we called transform um, on the test corpus using the fitted pipeline, it like, runs that data through that same pipeline, including the feature transformation parts. Um, so it, yeah, it basically to help you remember to do those things for a test data Great. too. Thanks. So your workflow shows the, uh, the beginning from the loading data to the deploying the data. Uh, can this pipeline has the function to use the new data to apply the model you just created? Um, right, so the question was like, How can you? How to create a pipeline right. that can load data and to apply the the, uh, the model you just created. I see. So I think the answer is like pipelines currently, 
basically support the transform like transformers estimators um, in terms of like loading data and export and saving serializing the data um, that is done outside the pipeline concept um, I think in and Databricks tend to uh, use, I guess, the notebook holds that full pipeline in terms of importing and exporting the data. Uh, but uh, the ML pipelines is pretty ML specific um, and does not include the data import and export, which is more part, I guess, provided by data frames. Yeah. So uh, our company works uh, a lot with international data, so non ASCII to text and analysis, et cetera. Uh, do all your uh, machine learning sort of tokenization, et cetera, et cetera, take Unicode into account, or is it sort of ASCII 2? Because you right. work only with ASCII 2 text. That's why I'm asking. I see. Um, so in terms of the types, we use yeah. uh, essentially Scala and Python strings. <laughs> um, so. Uh, there, there is pretty wide support, although um, in terms of the tokenization, um, the, yeah, ba basically the two tokenizers available are one which just lets by white space by default, and the other which does reg uh, regular expressions. Um, I haven't tested that myself with Unicode, but I believe it should be supported. Hi, my question is, is I did some TF, IDF, analysis also, but I didn't use a data frame object. I just use an RDD. And a problem I ran into, so in this case, to, in terms of the, like basically the next step, the machine learning process on it, it would require a certain format. So the RDD was of where each element is, say, um, a vector or mm -hmm. like a, an array of, of strings or something like that. Right. So here, that's this is, and then connecting the data, but basically back to some of its labels was very difficult. Here, that's solved because you're appending to the data frame, and so it's under the covers. Spark is sort of keeping track of that. Right. Um, I so I definitely agree. Data frames seems much more efficient. Can you do all the things you can do with data frames in terms of machine learning with normal RDDs, or is it, um, yeah? So is that problem solvable I see. outside of the data frame context? So as it, the question, yeah, can you use? Um, Basically, do data frames provide the same ML-related capabilities which RDDs do? And in terms of, uh, as a user, I would say yes, um, in that they provide you know, support for uh, very flexible types. Um, two caveats. The UDTs, I meant user-defined types, are uh, currently an internal API in data frames. So, um, it would need to be written under the Spark namespace to support like an arbitrary type in a data frame, unless you can represent it as a SQL uh, as a data frame supported type. Um, the other is, if you are implementing your own very complex algorithm, um, sometimes, for example, we do cast to RDD so that we can do a map partitions call. Um, but uh, I guess for for most users. Basically, great. We can take cool. additional questions. Okay, oh. great. Thank you very much. Thank you.